Hello everyone, my name is Nathan Yan, a second year PhD student at Cornell. Hi, my name is Ziwei Gu, and I'm a senior undergraduate student also at Cornell. Today, we will be presenting our paper, Understanding User Sense-Making in Machine Learning Fairness Assessment Systems. This work was advised by Jeffrey Storsky at Cornell. As machine learning technology is introduced into increasingly sensitive domains, it's critical to be able to understand analytic models. However, the very thing that makes them effective, their complexity, can also make them hard to evaluate even for experts. A typical machine learning pipeline involves several steps. Training data is collected, and the original model is constructed. Developers train, test the model, and ship it. Practitioners then continue to monitor its performance and iterate the models over time. The machine learning pipeline as a whole is very complex, with multiple steps and interactions between humans and the system. This complexity can create a risky situation. Recent studies in HCI and CS community as well as investigations from public media have found that machine learning models can often encode the inherent biases from both data and developers, creating a risk of discrimination and unfairness. For example, the choice trial model on a limited corpus human faces resulted in its racial discriminatory behavior. An investigation conducted by ProPublica exposed discriminatory sentencing recommendations by a black box algorithm. As we saw in previous slides, machine learning involves many interdependent steps, and bias may occur at any time and anywhere. Moreover, the way we define bias and discrimination is continuously evolving. In recent years, the research community has proposed many different metrics to detect and quantify bias. Metrics have been proposed from a group level trying to isolate the probability of predicting from sensitive features statistically. Another stream of bias detection work tries to block the path from sensitive attributes to outcomes such that the sensitive attributes are not the causes of the final prediction results. After detecting the source of the bias, the next step is to modify the algorithms. Many mitigation algorithms have been proposed. In order to make them useful, metrics are often integrated into human-friendly toolkits. For example, AFNS360 integrates bias detection and mitigation algorithms. Users just need to input the model and specify the metric they would like to use. Through a single command as shown on the right-hand side, one can easily get the results automatically. So how do such recommendation systems perform in the real world? Recent studies have shown that one data science practitioner might be unable to choose an appropriate metric, and even if they successfully choose a metric, then end users may be unable to effectively evaluate the results of the mitigation. Exploratory tools are one common approach for guiding users through these issues. Intuitively interactive exploratory tools enabled users to compare and explore how metrics work and evaluate mitigation strategies in context. However, they also require more time, effort, and initial training investment. In this paper, we sought to understand how the design of a tool, whether it works automatically or through exploration, influences the ways in which users make sense of bias and fairness in machine learning pipelines. We hope to inform the design of future devising systems. In order to understand what issues might be at play, we used AIF and then conducted a preliminary study of unexamined user log data from the Silva tool proposed by our team last year. In the Silva dataset, participants were instructed to use Silva to analyze bias inside the dataset and models. We logged the interactions between Silva and its components. Through the log data, we wanted to answer the following questions. First, how did participants make use of interactive devising tools? We want to know how participants get to know their answers and conclusions. Second, how do tools help participants reason about fairness in data and model? How participants perceive fairness and how do they seek evidence incorporating their domain knowledge to access fairness inside the dataset and the models? Specifically, if we picture fairness assessment as a process of generating hypotheses, what is the process of shaping the hypothesis, and finally identifying the bias. Finally, how do interactive devising tools shape participants' hypotheses and goals during sessions? 
and we are also interested in knowing how my tools use have been shaped by specific affordances. In this prior work, we found that using several cost participants to rethink their existing bias assumptions and change their answers about the bias source in data and models, though it took longer to use their recommendation tool. We found that participants have more interactions with the causal graph, which helps to find the source of the bias. This might be the indirect evidence that the causal graph interaction helps them to iterate their hypothesis, as participants can check the source bias with different combinations of attributes. However, this is purely inferential from logs. So, a few questions remain unanswered. First, we know that exploration and automated tools can help guide users to bias. However, we don't know the specific ways they should participants' analysis. Second, which interface affordances have the most or least impact on a devising session? Third, intuitively, more experienced users might benefit differently from automated tools and exploration tools, but is it grounded in reality? Last but not least, through answering the previous questions, how can we design better tools for defined datasets and models? So, where can we find answers to those questions? As the saying goes in HCI, from users to users. Users' behavior, actions, and even mindsets are the direct evidence. In this paper, we employed a think aloud methodology. We promoted users to voice their thoughts and reasoning as they used different devising tools. By analyzing users' reports, we hope to gain deeper insights into their workflow and influence of design features. In the following section, I'll be talking about the setup of our Think Aloud user study. We studied three devising tools that spread across a continuum from fully automated recommenders to semi-automated to manual exploration. Our intention here is not to be exhaustive, but to find those salient differences across the spectrum of device interface design. As a very brief introduction of the three tools, Silva is an interactive tool for bias exploration. It enables free exploration, it allows users to form groups, view relationships between attributes, and see intermediate fairness results on different metrics. AIF360, on the other hand, is a toolkit that helps users check bias by directly recommending protected attributes and visualizing metrics. The third tool, Google What If, is a hybrid of exploration and recommendation. It presents the distributions of attributes and at the same time allows users to experiment with different threshold and fairness constraints. Our study employed three public datasets, Adult Census Income, Berkeley Admission, and Compass Recidivism Risk Score, which span a breadth of complexities. Those datasets have been widely studied by AI fairness researchers, so attribute sensitivities are available as ground truth. We first used a pre-screen to filter out participants with prior exposure to those datasets and tools. Out of the three datasets and three tools mentioned above, each participant completed two tasks on two datasets using two different tools. We randomly assigned conditions across the 12 participants so that each tool and dataset received even and counterbalanced exposure. Due to social distancing constraints as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, all studies were conducted virtually through an online meeting tool. Each user study consisted of two sessions. In each session, Participants first watched a tutorial video introducing the tool. They were then asked to read a short description of the dataset and report the attributes they thought might lead to unfairness in a pre-task survey. Participants were then instructed to use the tool to find sources of bias inside the model or the dataset. After that, participants completed a post-task survey to report their findings and reflect on how their thinking changed. Finally, participants were asked to compare their experience with the two tools. As participants used the tool to complete a task, the interviewers prompted them to vocalize their current thoughts and activities following a think aloud protocol. For example, participants were encouraged to voice what attributes they were investigating and their goals. When the participant was not vocalizing, the experimenter reminded them to speak with questions like, what are you thinking? Although interviewers frequently encouraged participants to speak, they were not permitted to give hints or suggestions at any point in the exploration process. In the end, all sessions were screen captured and all the audio and video streams were saved for later transcription and analysis. 
As for the data encoding process, we used a multi-pass procedure to analyze participant reports. In the first pass, two members of the research team went through each video independently and tagged the video with timestamped codes for the specific analysis actions each participant took. For any activities where the two researchers did not agree, they negotiated until they arrived at one tag. In the second pass, the researchers worked together and examined the sense-making activities of the participant using a schema derived from the notional model. The second phase analysis tracks signals such as when participants are forming hypotheses, gathering evidence, or drawing conclusions. In the third pass, the researchers went through the sense-making activities and tagged higher-level events, and ultimately sketched a state model for each participant session. Once the sketches were generated, the two researchers recommend. In its final pass, the researchers extrapolated, pulling several models that were representative of patterns they observed for the specific tools and datasets, and began identifying higher level themes that emerged across participants. So here is an example of the encoding process. Within the blue box are the timestamped activity logs, which are generalized into sense-making activities shown in the green box. A state model shown on the right was then drawn by researchers. Participants all began at a starting node. As they used system features, they created new nodes for those activities. Groups of activities that were directed towards a specific hypothesis were grouped in boxed regions. As you can see here, transitions between nodes were directional, and looping behaviors as a result of iteration were reflected as cycles in the model. The layouts were improved to emphasize the serial versus parallel development of hypothesis during the session. Here are the final encoded workflows of different tools. The sense-making process in each tool looks very different. This suggests that tool design did shape analyst behavior. We can see each tool has different numbers of hypotheses, states, and interactions. Through analysis of each workflow, we come to some key findings. Looking at the encoded sense-making graph, we can find that there exist many hypotheses in different spatial orientations. Exploratory tool participants had more hypotheses and more looping iterations. Taking a closer look, we can see that the first couple of hypotheses overlapped with many others, as they were the starting points of participant devising. Over time, users iterate a hypothesis at the baseline and compare different hypotheses with that one. The comparison process contains many dependent hypotheses as users will adjust and come up with new hypotheses based on the evidence from the previous one. We can consider this as an iterative process which lines up with the prior research on iterative sense making. Moving to the hybrid semi-automated tools, Google What If, we see some behavior elements of both interfaces in the logs. Surprisingly, we found that users might encounter information overload when they try to balance the exploration and the recommendation. In our looks, we find that participants in the hybrid condition spend significantly more time on each hypothesis as compared to the other two. As a result, its sense-making process has fewer hypothesis nodes. Second, each hypothesis is working separately. Participants like looking at different tabs and swiping to others and never checking the previous one. We observe that participants benefit from the quick recommendation outputs and hence would like to check more in each hypothesis stage. And the semi-automated tools interface didn't offer friendly components to help connect and store their findings. They spent more time memorizing. This made the working capacity a limiting factor. Finally, we found recommendation tools bring answers more quickly and have higher efficiency compared to the other tool, as one might expect. However, in the interview study and scripts, many participants mentioned that they felt the tool AIF lacked accountability and transparency. The reported number of complaints is higher from the skilled user group. In conclusion, here are the major takeaways from our paper. First, think aloud as a method for evaluating devising systems. Second, account for expertise in exploration and recommendation. Third, balancing tuning and broader context in tool design. And finally, motivating efficient exploration through hybridization.
Thank you.